If you can, make it back to your seats. We are not through. We've got another man of God with a word for us. He needs no introduction. Will you please welcome our brother, Francis Chan. Can I get that uh, podium over here, someone? Um, you guys, let's, uh, let's, <laughs> thank you. You guys, let's spend a moment praying. Um, there's, there's been a couple passages in my mind where Jesus and John, I believe it's five, eight, and 12, where he talks about how he doesn't do anything or say anything of his own initiative. But like, like so, so he didn't just go and say and do what he wanted. He would only say what the Father told him to say. And I've been praying, I'm going, God, is that possible for me? to actually hear from him and then only say what he says. No, because there, there's so much pressure when you walk onto a stage. There's so much expectation. Like in your mind right now, there's certain things you expect from me. Then there's my own flesh where I just heard one of the greatest sermons I've heard in a long time, you know, through Damon, and I'm just going, I gotta follow that. <laughs> Even my friends that I brought that have known me for years go, you have to follow that? <laughs> and, and so guess what's going on in my flesh? And yet Jesus says, I don't say anything out of my own initiative. There are things I wanna say in the flesh. There are things I wanna do, and they're not bad things. You know, I mean, yeah, it wasn't like that, but like, they're biblical, but I really wanna stand before a holy God right now and say, God, I want this to be about your agenda and your words. So if you would join me in a word of prayer and really pray that I would have the courage to be as quiet and to say as little as he wants me to say or as much as he wants me to say. But not to be afraid of people, not be afraid of backlash, but just to fear him and him alone. Okay? Let's pray. The verse I keep hearing in my head is how he did not give us a spirit of fear. Father, you are so strong. 
you fear nothing, nothing. And we are your children, Lord. So God, right now in the name of Jesus, we claim this power that you've given us. There's nothing to fear. You alone are God. You're holy. I praise you, God. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you that you're about to speak through me, that your spirit will manifest through me for the common good, as your word says. God, I want that. Please, Lord, would you kill anything that comes from Francis Chan? And may this all be birthed of your spirit for your glory, Lord. At the end of this time, may your name be lifted up alone. May we all have a higher view of you, blown away by you, not thinking about humans, Lord, thinking about Almighty God. Please, Lord, reveal yourself to us right now that we just, just worship in an even more pure and reverent way through the cleansing, through your word. Wash us, Lord. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is true. In Jesus' name. You know, there's a, there's a passage of Scripture that for the last month I have been addicted to this passage. I love it so much. And anytime there's an ounce of like sadness, anytime there's an ounce of confusion, anytime there's discouragement or fear, I've been turning to this passage and it not only gets me over it, but it just gets me so fired up afterwards. And it's, it's in Hebrews chapter 12, in Hebrews chapter 12, because it describes God. See, sometimes I can, I can close my eyes and just start talking and not think about who I'm speaking to. And especially in front of a crowd, you can, just, you can just start praying stuff that you forgot to mention in your sermon or whatever else, and you just say stuff. Or you say stuff that you think people want to hear. But there's other times where you actually take the time to think about who you're speaking to. Man, and there's such an intensity about it. But this is, to me, some of the best news I've read or meditated on in a long time. It's a description of God. And in Hebrews 12, verse 18, listen to what he says. I love the, I hope you love the Word of God. Man, I hope you love this book because we live in a time when everyone's throwing out their opinions and their thoughts and they think they're so profound. Even Christians and authors and speakers and everything else, and it's like we've got to get back to this book because this book is so beautiful, so powerful. This is the way that the church is going to unite is through His Word. Hebrews 12, listen to this. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose word made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, 
the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Man, that gets me so excited. Do you you understand, like when, when you pray, You're not speaking. He says, you're not coming to what may be touched. Look at this description of God. You're not coming before a being that you can just go up and grab. You're not coming before someone who can be touched, but he refers to him as a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest. And when's the last time you heard a message where, where the guy teaching was describing God as darkness and gloom and a tempest? Yet this is the Word of God. It's, it's terrifying, isn't it? The thought of coming, he's, he's, he's making reference to the Exodus when he put darkness over the land. And, and the storms, the, the hailstorms where people would die. He, he goes, man, do you understand who you're coming before? This isn't just another person. Man, but, but he's a blazing fire and, and darkness all at once and gloom and a tempest. This is, this is crazy. This is who we are coming before. Man, you got to understand something. This is great news. Okay? Now, I know people say, wait, how could God, being a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, be good news? Because the world twists everything, and they want to believe in a God that's soft and cuddly and would never harm anyone. You know? But you know why this is such great news when I think, you know, because people go, gosh, you know, God can't tell me what to do. I have dreams, I have desires. I'm like, I'm pretty sure he can. (laughs) I mean, you don't, he he refers to himself as a tempest. And in Job, he answered him out of a whirlwind. Can you imagine standing in an opening field and seeing a tornado come at you? There's not a lot you can say, right? You can't look at that and go, I have dreams. (laughs) This is the God that I come, you know why this is great news? Is because if this God is for me, (laughs) are you kidding me? That is for me. Man, who could be against? That's great news. You know, before I came on the stage, Maddie gave me a hug and just said, I love you. So I believe if someone came on this stage to try to attack me, you're there for me, right? Okay? I mean, that's, that's cool. Um, I don't know if it's good news. I mean, it's news. It's, it's you know, there's, you know, you, you, you're bigger than I am, so that's good. But the thought of this being here, a tempest, 
a blazing fire, darkness, gloom, saying, Francis, I'm with you. I'm for you. I'm your shepherd. You want to see my rod? And my, you, you, if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, you don't have to fear any evil because I'm with you. Man, this is great, great news. This is our God. You guys, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's why Jesus says, he goes, don't fear man. What's man going to do to you? Kill you? He goes, fear God who can destroy your body and your soul in hell. Like you fear, this is a good thing. It's a good thing that we have a terrifying God. He says that uh, we've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering. Try to imagine that. So as I'm on my knees and I'm praying to this blazing fire, darkness, gloom, tempest, a voice that made the hearers beg that no more messages be spoken. At the same time, he's in this heavenly city with innumerable angels in festal gathering. And I'm speaking to, the, to him on his throne. See, so often when we pray, we just think about us. What we want, what we need, what we feel, I'm going, man, it's so much better to take your eyes off of yourself and, and, and just stare at him do this sometimes. Man, I, I say sometimes, you, you know, these things are the worst, right? And especially, man, selfies. Okay, it's, it's amazing that when I was a kid, if we would go to someplace like the Grand Canyon or out to Yosemite right by here, and we see a waterfall, we would stare at the waterfall. And nowadays your thought is, I'm going to take a picture of myself. <laughs> like, do you ever like just escape you and get out of selfie mode? Seriously. One of the best things I can do as a pastor or as a leader is come over to you and push that little button that takes you off of selfie mode to where you can't even see yourself and all you see is him and others. Man, it would be an amazing thing. That, that's what prayer is supposed to be for is that we go, oh my gosh. In heaven, are you kidding me? There's a, this, he's like a blazing fire, a, a tempest. He's got innumerable angels in festal gathering. And you want to look at yourself? But to just stare at him and worship him. That's why it's so beautiful watching you sing because you're taking your eyes off of yourself and gluing them on this God who says, worship me in a way that's acceptable, which is with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Well, you know, one passage a few chapters earlier, this, this blows me away. In chapter 5, verse 7, it says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Jesus was heard because of his reverence. Did you ever notice scripture says that? I mean, honestly, wouldn't you expect to say Jesus was heard because he's the son of God? Jesus was heard because he's Jesus? And yet, Revela I mean, uh, Hebrews 5 says, no, Jesus was heard because of his reverence. Think about how we pray as we set up these altars at home. As we said, which I sure hope you do, because this stuff, when everyone else is around, is wonderful. But as someone mentioned earlier, man, if, if it doesn't get to where you are alone with him, then this is all a waste. You have to know him. You have to be coming before that blazing fire with reverence and awe. 
Man, if this is the only time you worship is when you have a killer band here. Man, versus what was said earlier where there's tears in this book because you get alone with this book and you're going, oh my gosh, blazing fire. Oh my gosh, I can't, I can't touch a voice and make the, the angels, I mean, for, you know, that made the hearers beg no more, no more. Moses was trembling on that mountain. Man, it says, Moses going, man, I tremble with fear. He was just in worship because of the person of God. And that was before Hillsong. <laughs> like, this was just, I'm in the presence of him, and that's all I need. And I love Hillsong. I, I love all these bands. I, lo I love, I'm just saying, when we grow dependent, where it's like, that's the only way you can worship him? You, you need a speaker? This, <laughs> You got innumerable angels in festival gathering worshiping this being. Powerful, but I love it. It's such great news. You know what else is great news is what he says when he says um, in verse 25 of Hebrews 12, he says, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape, when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Then he goes on and he talks about how, okay, try to imagine this. He says, at that time he shook the earth. But he says, there's a time that's coming. I don't even understand this, but it says God's gonna shake the earth and the heavens. And then he says, everything that was made is going to disappear. It's going to be removed. Everything that was made, the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that things that cannot be shaken may remain. What does that even mean? Like, try to imagine God shaking the heavens. Do you understand the being we're talking about right now? He's talking about things we don't even get. How dare we come with any pride as if we have something profound to add to the discussion. We stand before him with reverence and awe because he's a consuming fire. And that is great, great news because he is for us. And. You know what else is great news? He's coming to judge. Again, remember, we live in a crooked and twisted generation. Like Isaiah 5 says, we take what's good and make it sound bad. We take what's bad and make it sound good. So when it comes to the judgment of God, we don't even talk about that as believers because we don't believe it's good news anymore. Don't talk about the judgment stuff. That, that, that's all. No, but he talks about it. And people go, well, that's Old Testament. No, this is, Hebrews is in the New. Revelation is in the New Testament. Okay? And listen to what he says in Hebrews 10, because this may dispel a, a lie that I believed from when I was young. In Hebrews 10, verse 26, he says, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think he w will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is the Word of God. This is good, good news. Man, 
I know some of you are going, that does not sound like good news. It is great news. My God is a consuming fire. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is the Word of God. The Word of God is good news. You know why it's good news? In, um, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, listen to what he says here. Chapter 4, verse 3. He says, with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. See, he says, you, you, he goes, this is so freeing. He goes, I don't care what you think of me. I don't care your judgment of me or any human court's judgment of me. He goes, I don't even care about my judgment about myself. He goes, I feel good about myself. My conscience is clear. He goes, but that doesn't make me innocent. I've got to stand before him, and he's going to bring to light what's been hidden in the darkness, and he's going to expose the motives of men's hearts. Man, is there anything worse, man, that feeling when someone accuses you falsely? That's happened to you, right? It happens to us all. We get judged all the time. And God's saying, hey, don't worry about it. Don't try to take vengeance. You don't have to fight. He goes, vengeance is mine. He, he, you know, Paul, Paul's saying, I, I don't care. You can say what you want about me. I got to stand before this guy. It's so freeing to know there's going to come a day when everything's going to be exposed. And he's going to say, here's Francis' real motive. Here's what he was really doing. I know for some of you that sounds terrifying. I get it. But there's also some great news in that we understand. So you really are the only one that I have to please. Because if you're going to spend your life trying to defend yourself in front of other people and maintain the right, you know, like a reputation, man, you're in for a long, long life a life of misery. Man, nowadays when people can just say anything and just throw it up, you know, and text it around and get it around, what are you going to spend the rest of your life defending yourself? It's good news. There's a terrifying judge who's coming. And let's not Let's not uh, get that twisted around like that's bad news. And let's, let's, let's get rid of this lie that, well, that was in the Old Testament. No, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is like, if you think it was bad then, right? He says that. Then he goes, well, look, if, 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 if you set aside the law of Moses, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? the one who's outraged the spirit of grace. He says, vengeance is mine. This is who God is. You've got to understand, we've got to get to the word because we live in a world that is going to twist it and say, well, how could a loving God judge? And you just go, well, he just says that he does. <laughs> you know, we, we have to go back to the Word of God. How do you twist this and say he's not a judge and he's not to be feared? It's just the Word of God. I've got more good news. This is a, this one you'll probably even see as good news. Okay. I have loved um, Ephesians 2 lately also. Don't you love Ephesians 2? That's such a beautiful, beautiful passage. He says in uh, Ephesians 2, 1, he says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, 
following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Man, are you seeing that? So that God, the blazing fire and tempest, he's also rich in mercy. That is the best news on earth. Imagine if that almighty God was not rich in mercy and we are just dead in our trespasses and sins. And he says, we are by nature children of wrath. Okay, again, is that what the world teaches? No, the world twists that and says, no, we're not children of wrath. We're good people. And we're gonna come before God, he's gonna see that we're good people. That's not what the scriptures say. The scriptures say that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. That means we just do what we want. He says, we, we, we follow the course of this world. We all did it. And it says that we were living in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Okay, this is what we want to do. Man, the world is saying, man, I have every right to do what I want to do, what I feel like doing, what's in my heart. And what God says is, man, that's the very reason why the wrath of God is upon you. As you're carrying out your own desires, you can't control yourself. Whatever you feel like doing, you just start doing it. And God says, you're following, listen to what he calls it though. He goes, you're following the course of this world. He goes, that's what the world's gonna teach you. Do what you feel like doing. Him, he can't tell you what to do. Do what you feel like doing. Carry out the desires of your flesh and of your mind. He says, you understand you're following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. He's talking about Satan. Do you know who you're following when you follow your own desires? He goes, you're following the pattern of the world, which we know that. He goes, but guess who the world is under the influence of? First John 5 says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And he goes, so you're actually falling right into his plan. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. So God in heaven, That blazing fire, tempest, darkness, gloom looks at me, an object of wrath, following my own desires, following Satan. And in the midst of that, he is rich in mercy and he loved me. He so loved me. Man, so that God, he actually is rich in mercy. It's, it's like, I want to forgive. So, so this terrifying judge wants to forgive. He wants to pour his mercy out on me. He's rich in mercy. He's like, gosh, I gotta use this mercy. It's who I am. 
I am rich in it, and I'm full of love for these people, even though they're, they're by nature children of wrath. And I want to make them alive in Christ. Why? This was my favorite part of that verse. He goes, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So do you understand what he wants to do in the coming ages? He wants to show off just how much mercy and how much grace he has by pouring it out on us in kind. This is my destiny, as God's going to show you. I want to show you just how much grace I have. I want to show you how much mercy I have. I'm going to pour it all out on Francis, and you're just going to watch. That's my destiny? Wait, so I went from a child of wrath, an object of wrath, to an object that receives his kindness so that he can show in the coming ages just how much grace he has. And what did I do? What did I do? Nothing. It was him. It was his grace. It's because that almighty, holy God, that consuming fire, that coming judge, it's because of His mercy and His grace. You know the verse, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your doing. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So we have a terrifying God who is a judge who wants to forgive us. And the crazy thing is even that the world will twist and make it sound like bad news. Like, I don't need to be forgiven. I, 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 don't, don't call me a child of wrath that, that God by His grace saved me. And, and so, so don't tell me that thief on the cross just from one word is now going to be in paradise after that whole life. I'm going to earn it. And I'm going, man, this is great news. I, I'm a sinner. Saved by the grace of God? You're telling me that having a terrifying God up there is bad news? You're telling me His judgment is bad news? Now you're telling me that Him coming as a judge who wants to forgive me is bad news? And not only does He want to do that, but He wants to lead you, which again, the world calls bad news. Because we don't want to be led. We want to control our own destiny. We want to build our own kingdom. We want, don't want to seek His kingdom. We don't want to be about making disciples like He commanded us to. But what God says is He'll put His Spirit in us to lead us. This is a very intimate thing where He says, I'll enter into you, and I'll actually start to manifest through you. Let me read uh, from 1 John 3. 1 John 3, verse 6 says this. See, this is such good news. See, when He puts His Spirit in you, He empowers you to get rid of all the sin that was in your life. In fact, He says this, no one who abides in Him keeps on sinning. Man, that's good news. If I abide in God, I won't keep on sinning? Thank you. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. Man. That, 
That is such great news that God wants his seed to abide in you. And when that happens, you can't keep on sinning because his seed abides in you. In fact, he says, if you keep sinning, then that just shows you that his seed doesn't abide in you. If you can just keep on sinning and not feel anything, not repent, he says, whoever, he goes, man, don't let anyone deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous, and whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning. This is, I know some of you guys are hearing this, maybe for the first time, because you're not in his word. But, and some of you guys are going, what are you, what are you, what are you saying? Are you saying that if I'm in ongoing sin right now, that I'm of the devil? No, I'm not saying that. John is. <laughs> and we have to do something because this is in the Bible. And it's this, this idea is this is how you can tell. He says when his seed is in you, this is why it's such great news, is today you can come before that terrifying judge. He wants to forgive you, and he wants to put his spirit in you so that you'll stop sinning. Man, you guys. I'm telling you, something happened in my life when his seed came into me, when his, when his spirit came into me, where the things I used to do by nature, once I start going that way, it's like, ah, I can't do this. It tempts me, but it's like, ah, I can't stay in that. He says, when you have the seed of God abiding in you, he just comes out. That's why he goes on all through 1 John going, that's why if, 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 you're, if you see someone in need and, and you have the means to help them and you can just walk on, he goes, how could his seed be in you? How could the love of God be in you? So then you start loving the poor. You don't even try. It's almost like it's just, it happens because it's in your DNA. His seed is implanted in you. Man, I can't go back to my sin. I can't walk away from Jesus. Why? Because I'm such a great guy? No, because his spirit's in me. This is such great news. Man, I remember when my second daughter was born, I was actually, if I'm honest, I was, I was scared when I first saw her because her face looks so much like mine. I, seriously, I was like, oh no. You know, there's a the joy of a child being born, but there was this fear of, oh, she looks a lot like me. And, and she's still, to this day, and, and when she was, you know, five, six years old, people would always go, you look just like your dad. And she would burst into tears. She would, I'm, this is not exact, she would just start bawling. And I'd have to comfort her, I know, I know. Like, I don't know, I'm sorry, you know? Like, a girl version of me, like this is crazy. I did, we didn't want this either. And, I mean, crazy, she's like 19, 18 now, beautiful. So I don't know, it, it worked out, but. But I remember just as a kid going, I'm sorry, honey, my DNA is in you. You put on all that makeup or whatever, you're still gonna, I'm gonna come out of you somehow. Like this is coming out because my seed is in you. And that's exactly what John is saying here in 1 John. God's holy, holy, holy spirit is inside of me. So I can't hate my brothers. He says, you can't do it. It's not in you anymore. He keeps coming out. I can't just walk by the people that are in need. I, I've got to do something because it's inside of me. And whenever sin creeps into my life, it's like, ah, I've got to get it out. Why? Because I've got his spirit inside of me. You guys, the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. That's what he did on the cross. As someone quoted earlier, he made him who knew no sin become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. 
through him. So I'm perfectly righteous now because the seed of God abides in me because I believe with all my heart that God so loved this world that he gave his one and only son and that anyone here who believes in him, believes in that act done on the cross and trusts in him, we don't have to fear death. We have eternal life. We don't have to fear sin. I've got his spirit in me now that won't let me go back to my sin. This is great news. It is great news that a terrifying judge longs to forgive you, enter you, and lead you. Right? It's great, great news. You know, when I came up here initially, and just during the break before this, I had a different message in mind. I was going to talk about unity because I was tired of all this fighting and bickering in the body. And as a dad with seven children, like we, we have so much peace in our home. I don't like, like our kids fighting and stuff like that. And what the Bible talks about, our Father hates it when we fight. He hates when someone stirs up dissension among brothers. He says in Titus 3, you better warn the divisive person, warn him again, then have nothing to do with him. Because he hates those who break up the brotherhood, the sisterhood, his children. He wants us to be one, okay? And Jesus said, it's when you love one another, when you become perfectly one, then the world is going to believe that the Father sent me and that he loves you like he loves me. There's something about our unity that is so precious to God that he says that will be the apologetic to the world. But as long as we come with arrogance saying, you know, you've got this wrong, you've got this wrong. You got, I'm not talking about we don't have discussions, but we've got to talk through this as family and love. You know what? I come from a different background than most of you, maybe a lot of you. And I've had to confess that I used to ridicule and mock anyone who spoke in tongues anyone who sought prophecy because I always, I was just kind of taught that you guys don't love the Word of God, you just love your dreams and then you just, you, you kind of check your mind off at the door and you just go with your emotions and you don't care about holiness. The last few years I've been spending a lot of time repenting and coming to my brothers and sisters who believe differently than me and just saying, I am so sorry that in my arrogance I used to ridicule you. And now I see these men of God who love Jesus with all their hearts. And look, there's still differences. I'm just going to throw it out there like, like, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, like I'm still uncomfortable. I'm just, I'm just throwing out there. Like when everyone starts speaking in their prayer language, you know, in an assembly, like my understanding of scripture is different from that. Um, another thing, when I read scripture, I, I see like a, a man should be the head of the home. And I know other people don't see that. And that makes me uncomfortable. But then I meet those people and we start talking about this stuff and we start talking about their love for Jesus. And, and when we come with humility, that's one thing I found as a pastor for the last 30 years. If you bring a humble 
couple, like a married couple, if they're humble, we can work it out. If, if they're arrogant, there's nothing I can do. God opposes that arrogance. But if we come humbly, like I come before you go, look, I'm doing my best. I'm sorry, the best I can understand this book is that I, I'm, a, you know, what they call a complementarian, that there's, there's male leadership in the church, in the home. I could be wrong, but it's the best I can understand it. Best I can understand it. Our prayer language is it, it, it's, it's like something that's private, you know, and, and it has to be done. But I could be wrong. Okay, that's the best I can under, And we can talk about these differences. Man, and, 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 and I, just, I just, I feel horrible because there's so much of my life I just mocked those I didn't understand. And they did the same thing to us. But I believe that blazing fire I was talking about, he, he knows whose theology is perfect. Um, and there's stuff we're going to have to work through, but he wants us to be perfectly one somehow amidst theological differences. And I believe there's a new generation rising up. And I believe the reason why God had me preach that message was he was saying, don't just preach unity, preach my gospel, okay? Preach my attributes, because unity doesn't come from us hashing through our differences. Unity starts with us both fearing a holy God. And, and me going, okay, you're a blazing fire. Your thoughts are way, way beyond mine. Who am I? And you tell me that Derek is your son. I'm not going to mess with your son. If he's your son, he's my brother. We're going to figure this out. Whatever is different, let's figure it out. You know? It starts with us uniting under the attributes of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why I came up here and he said, just preach the gospel, just preach the good news, and we unite under that. And we become brothers and sisters because we have his seed in us. And once his seed is in you, you won't be able to hate me. You can't. He says, anyone who hates his brother, the, 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 the spirit of God must not be in him. This was the safety. That's why I meet some people and, you know, hearing Damon, I heard the Spirit of God speaking through you. I can't hate you. I don't even know your theology, dude. You know, but I saw the power, the Spirit of God and everything else. I don't know every detail. That's the first time I've ever even seen him. And honestly, I did not expect that message to come from your mouth. I, I mean, it's, it's awful, but, you know, it's just, I don't know. You, you, uh, okay, anyways, um, I love him. It's weird though, because like when I go to England and people with like a British accent, yeah, you all sound smart. It, like the dumbish Englishman can sound brilliant just because of his accent. And then, and there's people from the South. And, no, okay. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, he's actually brilliant, and his mind is way beyond mine. I just wasn't expecting it, you know, so. Love you, man. But to me, I just go, I'm so excited about this, because we in this room agree that there's a holy, holy, holy God up there, right? And we believe that he's a coming judge and he's gonna expose what was really right and wrong anyways at the end. And that he wants to pour his grace out on us right now because he's rich in mercy. And he wants to fill us with his spirit so he can lead us into unity and holiness and into his mission. And don't you wanna just worship that God right now? Let's worship him.
We have the worship team come on up and let's just as one body, I think was mentioned last night, we have people from all sorts of different denominations. And let's figure out those differences. I'm not saying that we just brush everything aside. I'm saying let's just hold hands and talk about it. And let's act like children of God who believe in the gospel and believe that we were once objects of wrath and now we're going to be recipients of his grace, the riches of his kindness. He's going to just pour grace on us for all of eternity. And that's something to rejoice about. And we have to keep the main things, the main things. And that's why God called us to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to one another and unite under that and to worship him.